Um, so this is a great treasure hunt. This is a repackage of that's what we do on Sunday morning, except for on Sunday night we get to take our time a little bit more and we get to discuss some more things. Uh, so first off, some housekeeping. That is my email address, and I meant to get. And don't forget, we got to leave early. Can you do me a favor? Uh huh. We got to leave early. Can you go to the car? Yeah. And get my business. I got a stack of business cards. Where's your keys? They're in my console. Uh, oh, console. Now, don't forget, we got. It'll be early. easier to give, for, give you guys a business card that'll have most of this information on it. Yeah. Uh, what I would like to also do is get an email from. Everybody get me a contact, an email. Uh, like I've already got the Hansons and uh, I've got yours, I think. But what I what I can do is, you know, I'd like to keep us, you know, corresponding. Um, and if you guys have questions, please feel free to contact me. And if you guys have a ministry issue, you need, you know, I'm, I'm available 24-7. Uh, except for Tom. Well, Tom's not here. Um, so... Maybe Jimmy. I might not be available for Jimmy. Jimmy and Tom. If you're not Jimmy and Tom, not that, another Tom. Okay. Another Tom. I will wake you up. I know you will. You've done that before. So, there's all of uh, my info. This is my YouTube channel. It's real simple. It's Nelson and Four Ones. If you go do a search on YouTube, you will find all these videos uploaded from Sunday morning and Sunday night. And also uh, on my website, which is a, it's a work in progress. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Hold on a second, guys. Is that A&M that's a work in progress? <laughs> no. That is not nice. understand why my computer doesn't keep these screens. You say keep changes and then it just doesn't. Um, actually, you know what, I'm not going to be able to show you this to you guys because I don't have my Wi-Fi set up. So anyway, uh, being said, my info, uh, everything's on our, uh, our website which is fieldsministries.com, www.fieldsministries.com, and I'll send that out in an email. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'll actually log on. Uh, or I have, I'll have Vanessa put out a hotspot and I'll log on. So, uh, and I'll show you guys how to navigate it. It's, it's real simple. In the top right, you'll see a section called Learn on the menu bar. You click on Learn, and then you click on Sunday Nights, and they'll, that's where those videos will be, and the notes. So all the PowerPoint that we do will be saved there in an Adobe Acrobat so everybody can, you know, PDF file, everybody can read it. So we want to get your information too. So we can, uh, and there's my business cards. It's got my website on it. That's not the, that's my business card, not the. Okay, okay. I didn't get the other. Okay. You don't have that, but you might want the, the new website. So we want to make sure if my, my lovely assistant will pass around uh, uh, something. Put your name, your contact information, your phone, and your email on it. And I want an email that you check, not the one that you don't check that goes to your spam filter. So. Okay. You want those the contact sheets? That well, that's all right. You got a phone. Okay. Contact sheets, is that what you're wanting? Yeah. We have some people already. Yeah. Marks and here they are. Yeah. I'll need. Uh, we have David's. Yeah, we have David's. I uh, copy it. I can do Dad's. I don't have to. You know, I know this stuff. Except I don't think Wayne. I know his. Uh, I have a favorite. <laughs> yeah. Named after my grandfather. I don't think I have. Okay, session one. This is going to be kind of the theme. And it's one of my favorite verses. It says, uh, solid food is for the mature. For those who have the powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And we use this in our Go Deep class. And you see, that's why I left it up there, Go Deep. Because even though this isn't our Go Deep Sunday School class, what we're going to challenge you to do in this study is to go deep into God's Word. To not look at everything as a surface 
at the surface level. I challenge you guys to go as deep as you possibly can in God's Word. And you know, that takes discipline. It, it, it's a spiritual discipline to learn the Bible, to know the Bible, to study the Bible, and it's not easy. It, it takes years and years of practice. But what God promises is that your powers of discernment, in other words, you can tell when things are wrong and when things are right. They get sharpened because you have constantly practiced it. And until you do that, until you get to this place, you're not able to go for solid food. And so if, if you've ever had a time in your Christian life where you've looked back and you've said, you know, the Bible just d doesn't make sense to me. Or I read it and I don't get much out of it. I mean, I get stuff out of it, but yet I don't have all these revelations when I read God's Word. It's because you are trying to chew on a steak and you're still a babe. And for all, all of us who've had kids, you know that when you brought your infant home from the hospital, you didn't put a T-bone in front of them and a knife and a fork and said, go for it. That's just not the way it's done. And it's not the way it should be done in the Christian life either. We have to work our way up. But, you know, Christianity is where it's different than uh, raising children is eventually a child's going to eat. And they're eventually going to feed themselves. But unfortunately in Christianity, we have enabled people to stay babies for decades and decades and decades. And they never grow. And that's, that's a lot of our fault in the church but it's also we don't expect a lot of people uh, a lot from people unfortunately so what are we going to do well we're going to look at the world and the church before the rapture that's going to be a large part of the first few weeks we are on session nine in the sunday school class and we are just now getting to revelation chapter four and the reason why is there's so much to be learned about who we are as people in the first three chapters. So we're going to talk about the world and the church. What does it look like before the rapture? And in part of that is going to be building events. And as you, you know, how many of you have a GPS in your car? Or, or like, you know, you've got a GPS unit or you use your phone. If you put in a destination into that unit, you don't just instantly arrive there. If you've got that device, let me know because I got some real good uses for that thing. All right, this is not Star Trek yet. So every every journey has to begin with steps towards the journey, the the, the final destination. And I call those building events. You don't just arrive at the Battle of Armageddon. You don't just arrive at the Mark of the Beast. It's not going to be that all of a sudden one day we wake up and somebody's saying, take the mark of the beast. There's building events. And so what I want to teach you guys to do is, is if you look at the scripture and you understand the scripture, what it's saying, you can use some logic and kind of figure out, well, how could we get there? And I'll give you a sneak preview. We all know you know, most of you know the mark of the beast, one world currency. Eventually, we're going to have a one world government and a one world currency. That doesn't just happen overnight. It's not just going to all of a sudden happen. There's got to be building events that get us there. So some of the stuff that's going on now gets us to that one world currency. And I'm actually going to have Mark talk at one point in the future uh, as we get closer to that, as we get closer to the third and fourth seal of Revelation, about some of the things that he and I have talked about with the world reserve currency and the, the one world currency. And, you know, it was interesting, Mark, that I went back uh, a couple of weeks after we had that conversation. I sat down and I looked on Wikipedia at national debt, countries with debt. There are 192 sovereign nations in the world. 189 of them are in debt. Only three of them do not own debt, do not have debt. And they're like Liechtenstein and, you know, some little, you know, they're podunk places that, you know, you, you drive in, a, in, a, in an hour and, and miss them. Every other nation in the world is in debt. So 
How do we do that? How do we get to a one world currency? Well, you know, it's real simple that everybody says, well, let's just cancel our debts. Since you owe me and I owe you and I owe you guys and you all owe me, let's just do a do-over. And let's just go on a one world currency. See, that seems real innocent. And all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, that's a good idea. We, not long, long, we no longer owe $18 trillion, $19 trillion, whatever it is now, because apparently the budget numbers haven't moved in the last six months. I know some of you have seen that. that the national debt clock has not budged since, what, March or April or May or something like that. It's some crazy amount of time that we've been spending money and the clock hasn't gone up. So, so those are building events. What we're going to spend in the next few months, in the next few weeks, I should say, is the letters to the churches. These are so important. And the reason why is that most of the stuff that takes place in the book of Revelation happens after the rapture of the church. So you and I watch that from the mezzanine. We watch it from the balcony, so to speak. But the stuff that's in the letters to the churches, that applies to us today. It applies to us in our lives. And so we have to know what is written to those churches. And this is where those of you who are here on Sunday morning are actually going to really benefit going through the letters again. Because I'm going I'm to be able to slow down on these letters um, and take some time looking at them. Whereas in the Sunday morning, we had to kind of rush through them. But there's so many deep lessons there. And I could literally, I could probably teach an hour and a half on each of the churches. So we could do 10 hours of class on just Revelation chapter 2 and 3 easily, but we won't do that. So we're going to look at the role of Islam in Bible prophecy, which is what I did back in, what, July? Um, we're, so we're going, to, we're going to take a closer look at that. We're going to look at some of the things that are playing out in Syria today. I mean, within the last week. Um, some of you have you've heard about the, uh, the very first American that was killed in Syria by ISIS, uh, I think it was last year. And they did it in a certain town. Well, unless you know what's going on in Islamic prophecy, you don't understand why they did that. You just think they're barbarians. No. See, in the Islamic prophecy, it is in their prophecy that the, basically the Mahdi will, be, will come, they're, they're our Antichrist, their Messiah, will come at that town and they will meet the Romans, which they equate to us and the Western world. And in their prophecy, they're going to meet the Romans in that town and fight. And that's when the Mahdi will come. So the reason why they executed that American in that town in Syria is because they were trying to provoke a fight. And they know that a whole lot of them, even their prophecies say that a whole lot of them would be killed. A third of them will flee, a third of them will die, but a third of them will remain and remain and become victorious. And the Mahdi will come. So all of these things you see going on in the world that seemingly are chaotic, they actually have meaning. There, there, is, there is a method to the madness. Even when you look at ISIS, there's a method to their insanity. Even the beheading of an American in this no-name town in Syria, well, it's because it's written in their prophecies that that's where they're going to make the showdown with the Western world. And so why not do it there? So we're, we're going to talk a lot about that stuff. We're going to talk about Psalm 83 in Gog and Magog. Um, Psalm 83 is a very interesting prophecy. And we're going to talk a little bit about the unfolding of prophecy and in in, in what we see in the book of Daniel where God says he sealed the book up until the time of the end. And if you look at most of your commentaries when you go home, and when you read Psalm 83, you will realize that most commentaries do not say it's metaphoric, but if you read Psalm 83 when you go home, you're going to realize that, wait, this is exactly what's playing out in our headlines today. And what you will realize is that all these nations that are mentioned in Psalm 83 are Islamic nations. And they, 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 they touch Israel. And then what you're going to realize when you look at Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is that they're the outer ring of Islamic nations. And the, the ones that touch Israel aren't mentioned. And the reason why they're not mentioned is because they got wiped out here. And so we're going to take some good study at that. We're going to look at the book of Daniel. And we're going to talk about the rapture of the church. 
We're going to talk about who is the beast and what is his mark. So, as we've said, that we want to go deeper into God's Word. Well, the best way to go deep into God's Word is know the original meanings of the Greek and the Hebrew, including the grammatical structure. And this is where this is going to be a challenge. Okay? Uh, if you have the capabilities, I know everybody's not computer savvy and all that, and that's understandable. But if you have the capabilities, this is where your rubber's going to meet the road. So we want to know the grammatical structure. And you know what? There are so many tools online out there right now to help you with this, and I will help you. I will show you where they are. You also want to know the context. I would say about 95 to 96% of Scripture is I read it. I don't need to know the context. I don't need to know the original language. It is what it is. For God so loved the world, I know exactly what that means. It means for God so loved the world. That he gave his only son, it means that he gave his only son. So, most of the scripture, we don't need that. But when you come across those interesting parts in scripture that maybe you don't quite get, it's helpful to know what was being said in the original language. And it's also helpful to know what did it mean to those original hearers? You know, when you read the letter to Corinth, we tend to read it, you know, it's 1 Corinthians, let's say, we tend to read it in the eyes of 21st century Americans. But we have to remember it was not written to 21st century Americans. It was written to 1st century Corinthians. And something that means something to us, it might not have meant that to them. You know, um, I, I think I greet each other with a holy kiss. That's cultural, and it's still cultural today. So you have to understand the cultural context of what does that mean. And so today, you know, our cultural context of that is a good firm handshake and a sturdy hug or something like that. That's our culture. So we have to know the original hearers. We have to know their culture. And so as you study the scriptures and as we go through Revelation, we're going to soak in the culture. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we celebrated Rosh Hashanah today, and as you know, I explained to the class that there's so many things in the in the the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah or Tom Yashu, Yahuva, what Yeshua, the blowing, the festival of blowing, the sounding. There's so many things in there that al allude to stuff that Jesus said. Uh, one of them is no man knows the day or the hour. Well, we take that as just no man knows the day or the hour, but what we have to understand is in the context, Jesus could have easily been talking about the festival, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the blowing of the trumpets, because that was, uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah was known as the day in which no man knows the day or the hour. And also, it was also known as the day with the last trump, which was what we see referenced in the rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the angel will descend the last, at the last trump, we shall be changed. Well, the last trump is the last blow of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. So we have to kind of know the context. And what I really want to challenge you to do is not study any of this through your, the lens of your traditions. You know, I remember growing up, and we were real down in the Baptist Church on Catholics and Methodists and all sorts of other denominations because of their traditions. And then as I got older I realized we had our own. Okay, we have our own structure of traditions that we have elevated up there to godlike status. So I'll, I'll ask you a quick question. Where's the sanctuary? You are. Great answer. Perfect answer. Is that building in there the sanctuary? No. Yeah. But what do we say? Hey, I'm going to meet you in the sanctuary, right? Mm -hmm. That's a tradition. All right? Because um, te we're the temple of God. You know, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. Jesus Christ is right here because, you know, two or more gathered in his name. And so we have to, you know, one of the, one of the illustrations I like to use is a, a lady came up to the pastor and said, the children 
or chewing gum in the sanctuary? And he said, and he, he simply replied, oh, you mean the sanctuaries are chewing gum. Okay. So don't apply what you read through the lens of your tradition. Because the bottom line is your tradition was not in existence when this was written. And your tradition, God did not have that in mind at all when he wrote the scripture. And so we have to be very loose and fluid to get back out of our tradition, to back out and to get into the scripture where the scripture is. And a lot of the problems that we have it's because we have elevated our traditions, the traditions of man. And you know what Jesus said about the traditions of man. He was not real keen on it. And so just remember that we have our traditions too. So the best way to study is to have a prayer through prayer and have a relationship with Christ. Have a relationship with the author. Set aside your presuppositions. A lot of you, you're going to have to set aside some serious presuppositions as we go through Revelation. Because we have a very neat package deal where we have this, I could sum up, let's sum up the end times right now. Rapture of the church, seven year tribulation, midpoint, Antichrist declares himself God at three and a half years. Uh, we got. Uh, 144,000 uh, Jewish you know, evangelists preaching through and at the end of the seven years Jesus comes back and then we got a thousand year reign. Seems really simple, right? Well, I'm going to challenge you. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying this is where I mostly fall. Am I 100% sold? Willing to bet my house? Well, first of all, nobody can prove me wrong, and once I'm raptured, I don't care. But you know, I'm willing to bet my house on this. No, I'm not. It looks that way to me in the Scripture. But as we're going to see, there are some verses that seem to indicate that it may not be that easy. And especially as we get to the Church of Philadelphia, as we get to the letter of the Church of Philadelphia. So, note-taking. I really suggest you take lots of notes. Um, and I know some of you guys, uh, this is going to be difficult for you, this next one. I would really love to see all of you go out, if you don't have one already, and buy a spiral notepad. Um, buy something to write your thoughts in as you study, not only Revelation, but as you study any of your lessons. And let me explain, let me explain why. Um, this is my journal right here, and I know my father-in-law loves it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so so no, so this is my journal here. This is for this year, and what I do is I write my thoughts in on on the Word of God and I write what God's doing in my life. And why this is important is because. At some point in the future, you're going to hit a roadblock. At some point in the future, you're going to think God doesn't listen to you. At some point in the future, you think you're the worst Christian in the world and God's never going to show his love or anything to you. Well, that's what you put it in writing for. And also what you can do is you can write down your questions. As you come across a scripture, you can say, you know what, Lord? And there's a whole lot of those questions in there, and there's only a few answers. But you can say, you know what, Lord, I do not understand what this means. Can you please tell me what this means? And then pray about that. And, it's, and leave a little space. And as God gives you that answer, go back and fill that in. And there are a few of those in there where it says fulfilled or answered. Because you're going to go through those valleys in your life. And you're going to wonder. And you know what, if you write it down... I don't know about you guys, but I have a tendency to forget some things. And if you write it down, yeah, I do. I know, Jimmy. It's hard to believe. Mom's thinking about me. But if you write it down, you can go back. And you know, I sat down, I guess, a few weeks ago, and I went back through some of my journals from 1994 um, and, and when I was going through a really tough time in my life. And I was just amazed at how much I had grown in my faith. 
at the questions that I was asking back then, I, I was looking at my journal going, wow, I can't even believe I ever didn't know that, you know? And then I was able to realize, wow, look how I've grown. So I'm really not as bad as I think I am, you know? It, it, God, is, God is really, he takes his time and he disciples us. So I just, I implore you to do that. And, and to also write questions down that you want to ask me or ask somebody else. Uh, because you know we're going to forget those things. So also, get some help. There are all sorts of online resources out there, and we're going to go over a few of those in a little bit. But uh, get some help in studying the Word. I mean, I've got all sorts of resources. You should see. I mean, I've got walls and books and stuck here and there, and I've got them in the bedroom, and I've got them in the living room because we don't have any room anywhere else. And you know, most of them have dust on them that I haven't looked in the, at them in a couple of years. But you know, every once in a while, I have to go searching or she has to go on a mad search i'm like i gotta find this book it's this and it looks you know and i don't know where it is and it's craziness so get some help and there's a lot of help online and i will we'll go through that too so first of all eschatology what's eschatology Studying end times. okay pretty close study of end times technically it's the study of last things Okay, the study of end things. So eschatology could actually be the study of anything that's got an end to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be the end of time. So eschatology could be the, you know, the study of the end of a football season. You know, it's uh, not that you would want to sit there and study, but there are people who study that. But so technically the word means to study from the last things. And I like to look at prophecy like this. Anybody ever do this with your grandparents? Oh. Back in the day. Huh? Back in the day. Yeah. Sit at the kitchen table with a 1,000 piece puzzle or a 5,000 piece and you'd all sit around and you'd try to put pieces together. This is how God gave us prophecy. And a bunch of scattered pieces in a book. And it's a lot of fun to try to put the pieces together. And it's also a lot of fun to watch the pieces come together. You know, um, to watch these linkages be made. To watch these things come together. You know, and I, I promise you, when you study Bible prophecy long enough, I've been studying Bible prophecy since 1981. The very... Can you go, can you go back to what it, what it is? Oh, sure. I mean, yes. Yeah, it's just the study of end things. Yeah, I started studying Bible prophecy uh, because within about a month of me becoming a Christian, I was rummaging, rummaging through my parents' closet because I knew my mom had had some religious books in there. And I knew she had a Bible in there. And I came across Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And so I read it. I was absolutely fascinated. And it stuck. Even during the times... Uh, of my life when I was not necessarily walking with the Lord the way I should I was always interested in Bible prophecy in fact what it was Bible prophecy that caused me to rededicate my life it really, uh, a friend of mine my best friend Shane Arno and I were working at Duncan Dining Hall that's where the core eats at A&M and we were sweeping and mopping one day and uh, the dining hall is just like any college dining hall. It's huge. And there's two sides. And, you know, it's, I don't know, 50, 60,000 square foot. It's, I mean, it's tremendous size. And he said something. It got me, hmm. And because I knew a lot about Bible prophecy, he, I was able to start talking to him. And then that caused me to read my Bible again. And it caused me to rededicate my life. And it actually, it led him to Christ. Because he was, he was not even a functioning Catholic. He was just Catholic by, by name and, and, and didn't have a relationship with the Lord. And within three months, we were doing Bible studies together, studying Bible prophecy, and he, he found Christ. So I'm very fond of Bible prophecy. 
And another reason why I think I'm really fond of it is because it is this puzzle. And being a meteorologist, I like puzzles. Not necessarily the puzzles that we do, you know, games. But I like mysteries. I like to look for things that there are no clear answers. Yeah, and that's kind of the way the weather is. The weather is a, is a puzzle. It's, it's something that you have to put a lot of pieces together to come up with a forecast. And so in a way, Bible prophecy is a lot the same. So that is the, that is the, the difficulty, too, is that there's no, you know, you can look at somebody who's got a totally different opinion, and if you're honest with yourself, you can say, you know what, I can see where you see that. I don't agree with you, but I see where you see it. Because, let's face it, if someone wants to preach a mid-trip rapture, I can't necessarily debunk it or prove it wrong. That's the reason why it's a non-essential. Because it's not written in stone like Jesus died on the cross. So, what are our presuppositions? We, gotta, we do have to have some, remember I said drop all of them? Well, guess what? Pick some of them back up. Because, and I think you'll agree with me what they are. First of all, that the Bible is an intricately engineered book. Okay? It is, it is really, if you want to get technical, it is a book that is engineered by God who stands outside of time. He doesn't stand within time. So when we look and we call something Bible prophecy and say that this is a prediction, it's really not. It's not prophecy. The whole book of Revelation or at least the prophetic parts in, all, in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and all those, they're not prophecy. They're God's declaration of what he's already seen. We call it prophecy because our perspective, it's forward thinking. But God is viewing that at the same time he's viewing creation. And that is hard for us humans to get our brain, our brain wrapped around. That God does not stand on this timeline that we stand on. He stands outside. And that's why he can declare the end from the beginning, because he sees both of them at the same time. So what you have to remember with that is, is that everything that's in this Bible is there for a reason. And as I told the Sunday school class, and as I tell everybody that'll listen, whenever you come across something that seems to be thrown into the scripture, that just seems to be there by happenstance, or why did they include that little detail? That's a nugget. That's where you want to do your digging. That's important. Because I guarantee you, see, God did not waste time. When he wrote this book, he didn't just throw some words together and say, well, I got to have a filler here because this chapter is not quite long enough. No, he didn't do that. He purposefully put every word there. That's the reason why I always suggest especially as you mature in Christ, what we call a word-for-word -word translation and not a thought-for-thought -thought translation. So the difference between those two real quick are a thought-for-thought -thought just tries to convey the general thought of what the Bible passage is saying. Okay, So I could say if, if, if this is what happens, the thought of that is he placed the case on the table. A word for word would be, he purposefully placed the blue case on the table. And if I wrote that, he purposefully placed the blue case on the table. A thought for thought is just, he placed it on the table. Word for word is trying to be true to the original language. And if the original word is there in, in Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic, in a word for word, the word is going to be there. Okay. And that's the way I am, because if, as God moved those pens, if he thought it was important enough to approve, put the word there, I think it's important enough. And if we have to search high and low to get an English definition for that word, then we just have to search high and low. So, everything is in there for a reason. And Jesus even said, not one jot or tittle. Right? That means that every little mark in the Hebrew is there for a reason because it, a little mark in the Hebrew can change the word. It can change the letter. So everything is there on purpose. 
So remember that as you read your Bibles, as you just study, you know, not even Revelation, but as you study another book of the Bible, remember that every phrase, every word is there on purpose. And then when you come across those areas that seem a little out of place or seem to be like miscellaneous information, start digging. Because it's not there by chance. It's there for your edification. So, again, the best way to know how to study is study the original Greek and know the context. And don't study the lens through your tradition. So I say that twice because I want you to get it. So, let's see. Why study Revelation? Why, why is a good reason to study Revelation? Why should we be in here today? And we're going to try to be a lot more interactive than we can be in Sunday school. Because in Sunday school, we're just you know short of time. But we got time here. So why should we study the book of Revelation? What's a good reason? Okay, so you'd be ready. That's that's a that's a good reason. That's a real good reason. What else? You know what God's trying to tell us. You know what God's trying to tell us? Okay. What else? I always remember what John Hagee said, you have to know your enemy. Or did you say that? I'm, you I don't want that. you to confuse me with John Hagee, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I have said that. I have said that in the past. And I believe that was me that was me when we, we had the issue. Yeah, but yeah. I think he's also said that. Yeah, I think he probably has. He's a wise man. I'm just a little taller than him. He's really short. <laughs> I've met him. I was like, hello, how are you doing down there? So what what's another reason? To know God's word. To know God's word. Actually, there you are right there. Because unfulfilled prophecy is twenty five percent of the Bible. If you don't study the prophecies of the Bible, you're only studying three quarters of the Bible. So that's, a, that's not like 1%. That's a significant chunk. And then there's what you said, our blessed hope. It's, it's our hope. This contains our blessed hope. You know, you know why we don't weep and mourn like others? Because of this. It's, it's this promise that we have that even if we are at the end of our life and it's not a good end, God's promises are, are that there's something better. And you know, just think about it. Our time in heaven, that's a promise, but it's also a, a prediction. Am I right? Anybody here gone to heaven and been back? And if you did come back, why did you come back? I don't understand that. So that's a prediction. It's a prediction that we're going to heaven. So that's a prophecy. No, it's also a promise. Now, I, like I said, I will send these notes out because it's going to be hard for you to write all these down. But here's the thing. It teaches us how to live. All of these verses, if you will look them up, you will see it's, especially Hebrews 10, 25. Uh, this is an important one. Most of you know this one. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And we stop right there. But what we fail to be is part B which says, all the more as you see the day approaching. All the more as you, in other words, assemble, as you see the day approaching, as you see that you're getting into the end times, as you see these things are unfolding before your eyes, assemble even more. And, and the main reason is, is we can't do this on our own. You know, the things that are coming on this world, you cannot face them the economic hardships that, that many of us think are coming, that, that Mark is going to talk about, you can't do that. You can't face that on your own. And, unless you, you know, not even at your ranch in Edinger. You ain't far enough out of Houston, buddy. You, you might be in some little, you know, remote area of Alaska, and maybe you could face it on your own. But those are few and far between. You're going to need the people of God. You're going to need the people of God. So, um, all of these verses exhort us to study God's Word and to get deep into God's Word and to look at what's going on around us so that we can live good lives. Let's face it. What would you be doing tomorrow? And we've, you've all heard this hypothetical question. If you knew that the Lord was coming back for the rapture of the church and he was coming to take you home, would you still go to work? 
-hmm. Would you would you still sit in front of the TV and watch Monday Night Football? If I did, if it was Tuesday morning, I, I would forego. Plus, the games aren't that good anymore. Right? <laughs> but I would forego Monday Night Football. If I thought he was coming back in the morning, I wouldn't even watch the Cowboys tonight. And that's a big deal. It'd be good. <laughs> so fun for y'all on Thanksgiving back in the day. Oh yeah, it was. It was always a hoot. So that's the reason why. Because studying Bible prophecy motivates you to live a godly life. Because when you see all these things happening and you think the Lord's return is soon, I don't want to be found doing what I shouldn't be doing. I want to be found in prayer and studying God's Word. So why study? Why study the book of Revelation? Why are we here to study this one book out of 66? Because it's a promise. There's a promise. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for time is near. Now I'm going to ask you the Bible scholars out there a question. Is reading the Word of God important? Yes. Okay, it's important. We got that. That's unanimous, right? Is reading the Word of God give you a blessing? Yes. Name another book in the Bible that's bold enough to say, I am extremely special, you better read me, and you'll be blessed. Is there another one? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Revelation is the only book, and it's in verse 3, right at the beginning. Revelation is the only book that says, hey buddy, I am a very special book, you need to read me. <laughs> most preachers won't. And most that. preachers <laughs> won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I've always found strange because... It says, and, and we, we can look at the end of the book of Revelation, and it says it again. It bookends the entire book with, I'm special, I'm special, I'm special, you need to read me. And that means reading even if you don't understand. It means reading even if you're in 6th century Italy, and you're 1,500 years away from the return of Christ. It's still special. It's special all throughout time, whether or not you're on the doorstep of the return of the Lord or whether you're 150, 200, 1,000, 1,500, whatever years away. It's special then, it's special now. So that means that if it's special, there's something else in there. And it's not just for you to be able to know the end times. Everybody get what I'm saying? There's blessings in there. And there's blessings because he, he said it. I mean, that's just very audacious. Let me think about that. That's bold. I got 40 other authors, 65 other Bibles, I mean 65 other books, written over 2,500 years time frame. And this one is the one that says, hey, me. Which is kind of funny because it's John. You know, it's the Apostle John. And remember what John, you know, his mom was wanting to get him seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Got to love mamas, don't you? And so God said, okay, you know what, John, I want to give you something special. And this is what he gave him. Now, that did not come without problems. We have some problems. Confusing. Have you ever read Revelation and, and not been confused a little? I'll... I'll I'll just say that I'm reading it again for the millionth time, and I'm on chapter 5 right now, and I'm already confused. <laughs> okay? So don't think that you're going to get all the answers here. You won't. You probably will come out more confused than you were when you came in. Because like I said, you probably had to sip a little timeline, and now I'm going to go mess it all up. But that's okay. It's scary. I've heard that. How many of you have heard that? I don't want to read that because it's scary. I've heard it. Okay? Some of you may have even said it. I'm not going to touch that. It's scary. It scares me. Okay. God never promised you a rose garden. All right? There are things all throughout the scripture that should be scary to you. The, the idea of eternal damnation in hell should be scary to you. Uh, it should be scary to you that you know people that are going to be eternally separated from God. That should frighten the shorts off of you. It does me. But I tell you, it doesn't frighten me enough. 
Some people say it can't, can't be solved. You can never figure it out, so why try? Well, again, there's that blessing thing. Well, there's a reason why it can't be solved. It's because we don't know the Old Testament. What you're going to find as we go through Revelation, we are not going to study all 800. We're going to study a significant portion. One of the reasons why we as the church, we as New Testament Christians, especially in this modern age, in this society in America, and our pastors and our seminary professors, uh, I, I was blessed and Chuck and I were blessed to have some of the same guys. Um, and I think Joe has one too. Uh, some people who really understand this. But most people in the church are confused by the book of Revelation because they don't know the Old Testament. And that is because the book of Revelation, that jigsaw puzzle that you saw, all of those little pieces are found in the Old Testament. 800 illusions. So if you know the illusions and where they are in the Old Testament, and you know what the context was there, you kind of know what the context is here. We read in Revelation chapter 5 about the beast, the four beasts. You know, one had the face of a, of a, of a bear and one had the face of an eagle and an ox. And Well, that's like freaky, right? Well, all you got to do is go back to Ezekiel chapter 1, and there they are. And so you instantly know what that is. But if you just read it standing alone, if you just read Revelation 5 by itself, you have no clue what that is. What is that? That's weird. Well, if you know your Old Testament, it's not. So, this one's interesting. And we talked about this today in Sunday school. No one knows the day or the hour. Matthew 24, 36. So, what's our lens here? What's our tradition? What have you heard preached about this verse? Okay. Okay. Say it again, Dave. Don't set a date. Don't set a date. Don't be a date setter. Okay, what else? Is that pretty much what you've heard? It, you can't know. Okay? That's the context of what uh, our lens is. That's our context. You know? And I, I'll, I'll admit, I've said it from the pulpit too. All right? But what we have to understand is uh, using our best way to study the Bible, how should we interpret this verse? Tell me right now, how should we interpret Matthew 24, 36? No one knows the day or the hour. What do we got to do? Since, since we're going to, let's going to, let's say that that is one of those few percentages of verses that you can't take on face value that maybe we ought to dig a little deeper. So learning how to study your Bible, what do we need to know? What's the first thing? How about original language? Okay, maybe there's some clues in the original language. All right, what's the second thing? We've got language and then we've got culture, our context. So perhaps if Jesus were to say no one knows the day or the hour in English to us, it might mean something different if he said it in another language to a different group of people. Is that possible? Some of you say yes, some of you say no. Well, I'm going to tell you it is, and I'm going to show you why. This is the reason why you must, in some of these instances, get deeper into the Scripture and see what's being said. So who's listening? Who's Jesus talking to in Matthew 24? Okay, disciples. Where is he? Anybody know? He's on the Mount of Olives. He had just left the temple, and now he's on the Mount of Olives. And they had gotten a little spooked because they had one of those aha moments when they're, they're, they're looking at the temple and they're saying, wow, this is really great. Jesus, isn't this great? Aren't these pretty? And then he kind of crashes their world and says, you know what? Not one stone's going to stand upon another. It's, 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 it's not going to stand. It's going to all fall down. And so, in context, they're like, this is where the house of the Lord is. You mean this is going to be demolished? That's when they say, okay, 
tell us what are the signs that this is going to happen. What 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 what's going on here? Tell us what to look for. And that's the passage that we take this scripture from. Is that context of a bunch of scared disciples now freaking out because the temple, which they have, you know, just Herod had just rebuilt it and made it look beautiful. I would love to have seen what it looked like. And they're saying not one. Jesus is telling them not one stone is going to stand upon another. And you know, we know that was literally fulfilled. Do you know why it was fulfilled that way? Why one stone wasn't standing upon another? Have you ever wondered that? Do you think it's just cruelty of the Romans? The gold. Say it, David. The gold didn't melt. The gold. They set the temple on fire. The 10th Roman legion, which was, by the way, not Romans. They were Arabs. That's, that's an important little insight. The 10th Roman legion set the temple on fire. And it had gotten so hot in there from the beams burning and the tapestries that it melted the gold. And the gold melted and dripped into the cracks of the rocks, of the stones. And in order to get the gold out, they had to pry the stones apart to get the gold that had melted into the cracks of the stones. So that's the reason why there was no stone left on top of it. It wasn't just absolute destruction that they were going to destroy it to be mean. No, they wanted the gold. So in the context of this, this is who's listening to Jesus. They now have this picture of this beautiful temple, and they've walked in it, and they've seen their, their, their Messiah preach in it, and he is saying it that, and probably in a very matter-of-fact way, yeah. So it'd be kind of like if we were to, you know, I mean, not even, not even real similar because of the culture thing, but if, if we were to say, well, you know what, we'll see you at church next week. No, it ain't going to be here next week because there's going to be a tornado come through and all the things we're going to have left is a slab. See you later. <laughs> now, some of you would go, <laughs> now imagine that's the temple and it's beautiful as it is. So, the theme of the passage, of course, is his second coming. And it's all the events, not just from the destruction of Jerusalem, but it's all the way to the second coming of Christ. And there's a whole lot of stuff that goes in there. And in our Go Deep class in the mornings, we're about to start getting into that, into the Olivet Discourse. So, and we also see that all of these things are the beginning of birth pains. Matthew 24, 8. So the context of this prophetic picture is labor pains. Now, I see some ladies out there that have had some labor before. All right? So, let's, let's think about that. How does being pregnant differ from the way it was 2,000 years ago? Who? Okay, no drugs. All right? Any ultrasound back in Jesus' day? Okay. Uh, have pregnancy tests. No. Any, any, you couldn't pee on a stick and know, right? <laughs> um, so, did they even really know the whole cycle? I mean, they had an idea, but did they know exactly what was going on there? Yeah, they, they had an idea of the months. You know, they knew it was, you know, certain. Mm -hmm. But the development. yeah, they didn't know the development stages. They didn't know what was going on. Okay, they they knew a man and a woman come together and. There you go. Nine months later, you have a baby. That's the extent of the knowledge. Or twins. Or twins. Okay. So, here's the thing. Most times you didn't know you were pregnant until it, it's kind of the way it is today. Okay. Until you missed your menstrual cycle. And once you miss that, then they're like, hmm, maybe. It might be, let's say, let's say it may be October 1st. I don't know. I'm ballparking it here. Today, we can go, well, it's going to be October 13th, okay? I mean, you guys have kids and grandkids. You know how it is. Our due date. we got a due date. And, you know, sometimes if it goes too long, they'll induce you, and they'll sign you up for a C-section. And when you're signed up for a C-section, you know the day and the hour that child's going to be born. Yeah, that's going to be next Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Really? <laughs> Baby, I was like, wow. I've got my, my Bible on here. <laughs> I 
did sound. I don't know what what version is the quack. What version is the quack? Is that the Duck Bible, Duck Commander's yeah, Bible? Daffy one. Yeah, <laughs> Daffy chapter one, verse three. So, in the context, being pregnant is a lot different today than it was. And this is where I'm saying again, we have to get out of our mindset of what when we read the scripture, when we read labor pains, you guys who have gone through labor and us men who have watched you go through labor and you've watched your daughters and your, you know, your grandchildren, you know it's a little different than it was back then. And so what you have to do is try to think, what does this mean? So, let's think about it. Back then, I might know the month. As you got a little closer, as you got further along, you might could narrow it down to the week. And as you got within the week, you could maybe narrow it down to a day, as you get maybe a day away. And as you're in that day, you probably still couldn't narrow it down to the hour until the last hour. And then it's going to be sometime this hour, as your labor pains increased in frequency and intensity. And that's what Jesus is saying. No man knows the day or the hour, and it's actually a double illusion. I believe it's an illusion to Rosh Hashanah because that was the hidden festival. It was the day, the, the festival that started that no one knew the day or the hour because it was based solely on the moon. Every other festival and feast and fast that you have in Jewish tradition is based on a date that's already known, like the 13th or the 15th or the 10th. Well, you know what the 10th day of that month is, but you didn't never know when the month was to begin because the month begins when you see that first little sliver of a crescent moon. And they had people watching. And they knew it was either going to be on this day or this day. But they didn't know. We know through modern technology now. But they didn't back then. And so the, the idea here is that it's this unknown day. It could happen either today or tomorrow. But the idea also is in the context of labor pains. That as you get closer, you can narrow it down. So that's where we can look at culture. But let's look at the original language, and as we get, we're gonna we're gonna wrap up here pretty quick because we got a business meeting. Um, is there anything in the original language that can help us? So this is Esword, and as you see there, it says, but "Concerning that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only." Well, as we get down into the nitty gritty into the Greek, we discover something. We discover that the word to know that's translated in our Bible, no one knows, it's not the word know. It's kind of a mistranslation. Because the actual word is the word ido, which means to proceed with the senses. When I, when I say the word know, what are you assuming that I'm using? What part of my body? Your brain. Well, there's that word, gnosko. Y'all heard of Gnostics before, right? The Gnostics, they were seeking knowledge. Knowledge comes from the brain. This is to know something with your brain. The word that's used here that no one knows is not the word that, that, that starts uh, in your frontal cortex and, and creates thoughts. It's what you perceive with your senses. It's kind of like your intuition. Now, yes, that does occur in the brain, but it's not an intellectual function is what I'm trying to say. It's not something you can figure out. You want to try to figure something out and know something like I know how to fix a car, which I don't. But if I did, I would know how to do it. Or I know how to build a deck. That's something that happens here. What this is talking about is some of you have done it. I just know he is up to no good. I know that boy is trouble. Now, do you really know? You don't know with your brain. You don't have empirical evidence, otherwise you would absolutely know. He is trouble. But usually when you say, I know, you're perceiving with your senses that there's something about that kid. I don't know what it is, but he's trouble. Your parents been there before? Don't. <laughs> Not me. That's right. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't let her watch the video. <laughs> so, anyway, um, 
that's what Jesus is saying here. No one perceives the day or the hour. Well, we can even get into further Greek. What you're going to see is, and we'll look at Esword next week because I don't want to get into it. Uh, we'll have time next week. Uh, what you're going to see in Esword especially is these little letters here. And what this tells you is, who was English? Anybody English teachers here? No? Okay. I always get in trouble when I get around English teachers. <laughs> I'm not real good at it. All right. What these words here, these uh, letters here, these tell you exactly how that Greek word is written. And in this particular instance, uh, what it tells you is that it's written in the perfect tense, the active voice, the indicative mood. That actually is very important. Because what that tells, and here's a, uh, I will send all of this out on an email and I will print it up and hand it to you guys. Because uh, what this, this comes, this is the link where I got this. And there's other links that tell you, and I'm going to show them right here. It tells you what does this verb mean. So we know it's the verbs in the perfect tense. We know it's in the active voice, and we know it's in the indicative mood. So now let's look at no man perceives. Because it's in the perfect tense, it means that the action is completed at a specific point in time past with continuing results into the present. All right? It doesn't mean that the results continue into the future. Okay, so let's, let's put it this way. No one knows the score of the Dallas game tonight. Is that a fair statement? No one knows what the final score of the Dallas game will be tonight. God knows, right? Now, if I asked you tomorrow morning, what is the score of the Dallas game? Can you tell me? Yeah. Okay. That is an example of the perfect tense. Being Perfect tense means that it's something that, happened, that no one knew a month ago, no one knew a year ago, no one knew a hundred years ago what the score of tonight's Dallas game was going to be. But tomorrow they will. Because what the perfect tense says is that, that it, the action is only for the present and the past. It has no bearing on the future. That is another Greek tense. There's another Greek tense that's used if you want to say no one will, like let's say the Cowboys game gets canceled tonight and so it never gets played, which wouldn't happen. No one would ever know because they would never play the game. That's a different tense. So now what we see Jesus is saying is that no one knows right now. He's not saying no one will ever know. And matter of fact, you can even read in your Bible. Does it say no one will know? It says no one what? No. Now, is that a present tense? That's present tense, right? That's not future, is it? Because it doesn't say will know. So that's why I'm saying we have to really dig deep. And this is, the whole class is not going to be like this. This is just an illustration <laughs> of what we're going to do. Okay? It's in the active voice. <laughs> it's in the active voice. <laughs> it's in the active voice. That means the subject is the one who performs and produces and experiences the action. And so the no one is the subject there. So you're going to, we experience the action of not knowing in the present tense, but it doesn't mean the subject, me, will not know tomorrow. Okay? <clears throat> so it's whenever something's in this tense, we have to look at it very carefully. And, it's, and is, there a, is, there a, is there a gate that refuses knowledge into the future? And that's what we, you know, and in this case, there's not. So it's open to the possibility of us knowing the day and the hour is what I'm saying. All right? It's an indicative mood. And what the indicative mood is, is this a fact? This ain't opinion. It's not one man's opinion. It's not one man's idea. It's not one man's concept. It's not one woman's uh, thoughts on the matter. It's a fact. It's not... The Texans are the best team. It's not the Dallas Cowboys are the best team. See, that's not a fact. That's an opinion. Okay? That's a, that's a thought. A fact is that in Rochelle, in Texas, it is Sunday. That's a fact. So that's what the indicative mood tells us. So 
like I said, the important there is the context of the, of the uh, labor pains. And it's something we know as facts, but perceive what, not something, it's not something we know as a fact, but we perceive. And so when we think about that, and I'm going to look at that. When we think about that, and this is where we're going to stop for tonight, um, we may know, is what I'm saying, that, that that scripture doesn't necessarily, I'm not saying it does or doesn't, but what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily mean that we can just say, oh, we don't ever know. So we shouldn't study. Okay? Because in the context of labor pains, you know, for those of you who have given birth, when you were in your final hour of labor, I think you probably knew that there was about to be a baby there. I doubt any of you said, you know, I wonder maybe a week or two from now. Okay? So I, since I don't know, I shouldn't go to the hospital, call the doctor. Right? We're just going to wing it. Let's go on a picnic. Okay? So that's the context. And that's what we're going to study. Can we know the day or the hour? I don't know if we can or not. You can know the season. And if you know the season and you see the season approaching, what should you do? Prepare and be ready. And how do we do that? Get on our knees. Get on our knees. And, you know, if you guys haven't seen The War Room, please go see it. It is a good show. It, it, it makes you leave thinking, huh, wow. I wish I had a prayer like that, like, like that lady. You know, call down fire from heaven was praying like that. And we were really blessed last night to have a, a good group with us. But also there was, a, there was another group in the theater that, that were adding some, com <laughs> some ongoing commentary that was really uplifting. And I don't mean that sarcastically. I mean, it was, a, it was fun to watch. There were, there were some amens going on. Yeah. <laughs> preach it. You preach it. <laughs> it's great. A little light reminded me of my grandma. Yeah, really. She did. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of mine, too. Uh-huh. So this is, this is a little shorter tonight because we do have a business meeting. But this is where we're going. And next week, we're going to look at the Christian eschatological views. Yeah. Eschato we're going to look at the different views of the end times that people hold. Because, you know, there are people out there that believe that everything that we're going to read has already been fulfilled. It was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Preterists. Yeah. We got amillennialists. We got postmillennialists. We got preterists. We got fu uh, futurists. And we got historicists. And there's all sorts of ists out there. And we're going to study those. And we're going to see why being a futurist is the way to go. So let's close in some prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time of study. Lord, as we just continue to uh, open your word, I pray that you will open it to us too. I pray that we will just sense your word, uh, that we will perceive it with our senses, but we will also know it with our heads. And Father, as we go forward, Lord, uh, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to look at your word and to study it together as a group. And we give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.